You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Can we just get out of the way at the beginning of this show, uh, all the hubbub over this new sports channel that the White Sox and the Blackhawks and the Bulls are going to be on? Can we just can we just settle something real quick? Everybody's in a tizzy over the fact that it's not on YouTube and it's not going to be on or YouTube television and it's not it's not going to be on Comcast or it isn't on there yet. And everybody's like, well, how, how do I watch it? And, and I got to be honest with you, Ed, I cut the cord years ago. I stopped paying for television years ago. Like I just stream apps and I have a set of rabbit ears and I've been using the rabbit ears to watch Bears games, especially when they're on Fox 32 because there isn't really a streaming app to watch them. So for years I've done that. White Sox games, I go hang out with dad. It gives me an excuse to get out of the house. I go up to the bar up the street. Like I go find places to watch the game that's what I've been doing the last couple of years. I love this new setup because I can watch it on 62.2 whatever. All you do is take rabbit ears, Ed. You can use any kind. You don't even need to have HD rabbit ears. These televisions over the last 10 years, they're built in a way that your old rabbit ears from your college dorm years, and I know some of you are younger than me, but back in the late 90s, I had rabbit ears on my TV so I, so I could watch television. This was the thing. For for those of you who are, who are a little unclear on the concept what what christopher is talking about is not actually lopping the head off of a rabbit no it's an antenna it's a little antenna yeah, thing. yeah it's 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 one antenna there's two antennas and you pick them up and they look kind of like rabbit ears like what you'd put behind somebody's head in a photograph if you haven't explored this do it you will you'll be amazed at how much free content is just sitting out there like if you get a little set of rabbit ears the cheapest kind go on ebay but you don't need to buy the expensive ones. You can if you want the picture to be perfect, because sometimes it jumps, depending on the signal. Sometimes I get to watch an entire Bears game and never jumps. The signal has always been worse further down the dial. Depends on where you're at. Like, CBS 2 is always more jumpy than WGN. But if you're old enough, you, you actually remember that being the case growing up. Like It's still the same. There were some, yeah, some of the channels, just they didn't pick up quite the same, depending on where you were, your area. But now they're in digital HD quality and there's all kinds of sub channels. So if you take an antenna and you plug it into the back of your television, the amount of free TV that you can get, like shows that you remember when you were young, live programming, news, sports, there's so much and it's completely free. And all you have to do is take the time to get an antenna and plug it in the back of your TV. Now I get that everybody's like in a tizzy because they just want it inside of their their package, right? Like you like spending $80 a month for YouTube TV or whatever the hell it is. Cause I know it was going out of control. That's why I stopped doing it. You know, you like to have your TV plugged into a wall where a cable runs through your entire house and goes out, goes out of the house and Comcast pumps it in whatever you love doing. Right. But you're spending so much money on it. I mean, I, I think I may spend with all the apps that I have to watch television and my rabbit ears less than $30 a month for television. And we never run out of we never run out of entertainment options, and I'm able to get all the live sports I could possibly think of. All the live sports, and them being on free TV, that's the best part of this whole deal. Like Everybody's like, well, I can't wait till there's an app that I can pay $9.99 for so I can watch it through the app. Or you can get rabbit ears and pay nothing. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, like it's, it's the weirdest argument, and, and I've been so quiet about it over the last couple of weeks because everybody's so fired up, and I get it if you don't live in Chicago. Like, let's say you're outside of the broadcast range of it. I get that then. I understand your frustration. But if you live in the Chicagoland area, we're back in the 1980s. They could pick up these stations on their TVs. You can still do it now. And the picture's better and the signal's stronger and it's free. One time, if you don't have an old pair, like, first of all, go check the storage area with all of grandpa's old stuff. Okay? When, when dad passed years ago... I guarantee you somewhere in his junk drawer, there's a set of rabbit ears, little antenna, and plug it into the back of the TV and be amazed. I, the way that people are so fired up because they can't watch this new channel, and I love bashing Jerry Reinsdorf. It's one of my favorite things to do because he sucks. But 
This is the greatest thing ever. The idea that I can just now find them on free television and watch it. You know, I, I think it's it's strange. It's a generational thing. It's clearly a generational thing. It's cl- people who don't understand that there's free television going through the airwaves, just like radio. Radio's free. Television's free. It's the, all you need is a little receptor. You can pick it up. And, and the fact that they're on something right now that you could pick up for free, folks, if you don't like Jerry Reinsdorf and you want to rip him off, watch some free television on Rabbit Ears. That's what I'm doing. I'm not buying the app. Like they're all talking about how they're going to get him an app eventually. I'm not paying for that. As long as it's on 62.2 or 62.3 or whatever they're doing on my digital uh, free television with my Rabbit Ears, I will be watching the White Sox on that for free. Once again, I found a way to get the product without having to give that miser any money. Thank you. Yeah, well, and and you're not not giving him money, but you're not giving him extra money, okay? Because he, he he's guarantee I guarantee you, he's he's making some money off the ad revenue and all that stuff, which right, is right, right. But you know what? But I'm not really helping him at that point, right? No, no. It, it, and here's here's my laugh about the whole thing too. That I was reading on Awful announcing that the carriage issue with Comcast is that Comcast wants this channel to be only available on their highest tier. <laughs> You know what Comcast is relying on? What are you doing? Why Why would no one's paying extra for the White Sox? Comcast is relying on the fact that you can't figure out that it's free. Right. Comcast is like, well, these these morons, they, they don't know how to plug in rabbit ears in the back of their TVs. Let's jack up the price. I mean, it's, it, you know, and here's the funny thing. There are technically sound people who would sit there and tell you a couple years ago before Major League Baseball closed the loop. How to get a VPN address through your computer that showed that you weren't living in Chicago if you were there. So you could go and get a VPN address and pay for it that would make everything think that you weren't you weren't in Chicago. So then you then their systems, Major League Baseball, would think you were living in Colorado and then you could stream through MLB TV White Sox games. And people were doing that. And that's trickier than plugging in rabbit ears. It was a lot trickier. Yeah, now we're going back to like old school workarounds and people can't figure it out. And this isn't even a workaround. They're advertising it. It's free. It's on your television. It's, this, it's the dumbest thing in the world. I, I Again, I get it for the people that are in the outlier counties that may not get a very strong broadcast signal and can't get that channel. But if you're in Chicagoland, all you need to do is dust off the old antenna and just plug it in and you're good. Watch the games. Enjoy. You can buy you can buy really nice ones too that'll pick up the signal even better and it's going to be a lot cheaper than 6 months of streaming it and definitely a lot cheaper than paying for YouTube television or anything else like that. It is it maybe one of the silliest things that I've watched over the last month the complaint over this new White Sox network. The old school people remember that Jerry Reinsdorf had a scheme where you had to buy a box specifically only for the White Sox and then you had to well, like that's how- yeah. Uh, right, it was like closed circuit television just to watch the on White TV Sox. was was a big was a big deal to to have to have that little on TV box, and and that was that was Eddie Einhorn when when he was uh, essentially Jerry's partner, that was his his whole deal, right? Jerry was a, a real estate guy. Eddie Einhorn wanted to do this. He was he was a cable guy before cable was really prevalent enough to be you know in every in every home or be like the standard for it. So I think we're just so jaded because the White Sox, the first thing they did 40 years ago was take it off of free TV and try and put it on to something paid that not everybody could afford to do or, or could even even reach. And now here we are 40 years later, and they're it, it's laughable because they're arguing with Comcast over a free over-the-air channel. They're back on. They're on free television. They're on CHSN, and you can watch it for free if you're in the Chicagoland area. Again, I, I understand the convenience issue and how people sit around. They've gotten used to the way that they get their television. You got to go a little old school on this one. Go a little old school. Watch it for free. Calm down. Socks in the basement listeners for exterior windows, doors, patio doors, and storm doors. Look no further than window and door superstore of Oak Forest. They are not traveling salesmen who show up at your door with a dingy little example and you got to look in a book and try to pick out what your windows are going to look like. Instead, get into their big, beautiful showroom where there's an owner on site and also on site when they put in your windows. All window and door superstore installers, they don't farm out the work. They've been doing it that way for 40 years in Oak Forest since 1985. All major brands are custom made and no stock items for a perfect fit. 
Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest is one half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280 159th Street. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. Every once in a while, it's not an article or something I see on television or hear on the radio that gets me to bring in a guest. Sometimes it's just a tweet in the middle of a week during the offseason when the White Sox aren't playing and we're watching other teams in the postseason. And Elijah Evans of Just Baseball and also Future Sox put out a tweet. Uh, and I said, well, I want to talk to you about this because it's what we're talking about today on the program. And it's all about free agents that the White Sox may bring in. It's not going to be an empty off season. I don't believe it. Elijah doesn't either, I don't think. How are you? I'm doing good, Chris. Appreciate you having me. I, I agree with you. I don't think it's uh, it's empty. I think it's going to be not thrilling, right? It's not going to be a one Soto off season. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, but I do think, you know, where, where the team is at right now, right? Like there is very few players on the books and a ton of young players. And you got to at least bring in a few guys to supplement those young players and try and fill out the roster in addition to trying to flip some guys to deadline eventually. Yeah, I mean, we figured it out a few weeks ago that that honestly, with the arbitration and what's actually under contract and they don't need to tender everybody, they could really walk into this offseason at about $40 million. Uh, and then and then even if they end up at the bottom of payroll in Major League Baseball, that was in the 90 millions this past year. So right. they have some room to go out and sign some guys guys and a lot of the things that have been suggested uh, is similar to what you've suggested. First, it's deep at first base. There's going to be a lot of first basemen yep. that are going to be available out there and they're an upgrade over anything the White Sox have right now and flippable likely at the midseason point if you wanted to do that. Uh, outfield, there's a deep outfield out there. Right field has never gotten solved. You got Ben and in left. You got Robert in center, but the outfield is one. And then a lot of people suggesting relief pitchers. I saw you doing that today because they're easily flippable. If you get a good one that somebody's going to want, you can get yourself a top tier prospect at the midway point. So you, you may want to invest in it. The only thing I, I'm not sure about is do I need a starting pitcher? Because I love this young talent that's coming up and I know you love prospects more than I love prospects. So they, they may be okay there. So those were the positions, though, that you were kind of looking at as well. So take me through this. I'll give everybody kind of a list. Uh, we'll, we'll start. Let's start in the outfield. Michael Conforto, Michael Taylor, Max Kepler, Harrison Bader. These are four names you threw out there into the ether. Um, why these guys? I, I'm not opposed to any of them, but you think this is the type of player in the White Sox uh, wheelhouse right now? Right. I, I think so. There, there's tiers, right, of the offseason, right, in terms of outfielders, right? You've got your Juan Soto, obviously a tier of his own. Beyond that, you've got Anthony Santander, Teoscar Hernandez, that kind of elk, Tyler O'Neill as well, who are players that are coming off, you know, really good seasons that earn themselves a huge payday. The White Sox aren't signing those guys, unfortunately. That's just the reality. They're not, those guys want to play for contenders. They've earned the ability to play for a contender. They all had huge seasons. They're not in that tier. Then you go down this, this, this kind of next level of like the veteran quality starters who have been around the league have done some things and are, are versatile too right so all these guys you know three of the four that you mentioned there that I, that I pointed out are guys that have played all over the outfield a little bit uh can forward or not as much but you know guys that are experienced vets multiple of them being lefties i really particularly would like a lefty i think they'd be good at i don't mind the idea of a righty as well but i think these are you know low like early 30s veteran outfielders who have been solid players at some point in their career. They, yeah, they're not a star. They're not going to be flashy, right? I think Conforto is probably, the, you know, Conforto is more of that, that veteran guy who had a good year coming off. He's been up and down the past few years, dealt with some injuries, but generally a veteran presence. I think Kepler is your highest upside guy here, but he's coming off a rough year. So I think you can kind of buy low on a guy like Kepler and hoping he improves. And that you've got Bader and Taylor who – gives you some versatility. And also I like the idea with those two because they've been center fielders most of their career. So those two can play a right field, but then if you get a good season from Luis Robert and you're able to trade him, you've got two guys that can immediately, one of those guys could potentially immediately play center if you were to trade Robert to deadline. So I think those are all in the tier of like, you know, they all were solid starters. They're not going to be a great player, right? But all of them have been quality MLB starters for some years now. They're in their 30s, so they're not going to cost a ton. And they're versatile enough where they can serve multiple purposes for the White Sox, whether it be winning right now or potentially being flipped at the deadline. Kepler is the most interesting one to me because I agree. he's had some he's had some big years and there seems to be no pattern yeah. to it, right? Like all of a sudden, like if you look at him, like he's a 36 home run guy, then he hits nine, then he's back to hitting 20, and then he then he hits nine, then he hits 24, then he hits eight. I mean, I guess that's actually a pattern. He's he's due for about 25 home runs next year. Right. Maybe they should sign him. Like it's it's weird when you look at him because you're like, where's the consistency? And there have been some injuries. 
So I, I you know, that uh, that's what I'm weary about as a White Sox fan. As a guy like that, we we've dealt with so many guys that get injuries. We're not a team that keeps keeps guys healthy, but a healthy Max Kepler probably fits what they're willing to spend and gives a little stability in the outfield. Let's take a look at uh, another position here, uh, first base. Uh, Reese Hoskins is an interesting name. Josh Bell, uh, Wilmer Flores. I wish they'd go a little bit bigger, though, on this, right? Like, I mean, it feels like there's a few names that, that are in that tier above that maybe they can get to sign a two-year deal that they could still flip. I, I mean, is that where you think they're at, at the Hoskins and Bell level? Kind of, unfortunately. Uh, I, I, the thing with the free agency on the, on the first base side, there's a lot of first basemen, right? The A tier is, is Christian Walker, Peter Alonso. They're not getting either of those guys. Then you go down, and it's like, do you really want to spend – I mean – I don't hate the idea because if you're going to flip them anyways, then fine. But are you really going to go out and spend a lot of money on a Carlos Santana or a Paul Goldschmidt or a Justin Turner who are in there, you know, for about to be 40 or already 40 in some cases? I mean, you know, Santana's coming off a great year. He's familiar with the AL Central. Maybe that makes sense as a one-year deal, just flip them at the deadline, okay? But none of those guys are really – I'm not sure any of those guys are worth the value. And then that next tier is kind of Hoskins, Bell, um, you know, Anthony Rizzo, no, Wilmer Flores, yeah, I mentioned him. Joey Gallo, I guess, is not a terrible idea in that in that same kind of tier. Um, I do think though Hoskins and Bell are honestly, you know, provide some upside. Both those guys have been pretty decent power bats at points in their career, right? So it's like they give something um to, to look for and something to potentially hope for. So I, I think it's it, yeah, it'd be great if they could get a Christian Walker to, to sign with the White Sox, but I just don't see that being realistic. So I, I do think it goes down to that next tier of Hoskins, Bell, Gallo, Flores, whatever. Um, and I think one of those guys would be fine, right? I mean, end of the day, like, it, it, it comes down to whether or not they're going to move on from, from Andrew Vaughn, right? And I, I think Sheets is all but gone at this point. Uh, Vaughn's the bigger question mark there. Uh, but I do think it's like Vaughn is he hasn't taken the step, right? He's had some, he had some good months this season. He had some good games this season, but it's like he hasn't taken steps forward. So why are we at least try to pivot? Maybe and maybe they try to trade him instead of just letting him go or non tendering him. Right? Like I'm not sure what they're going to do with Vaughn. There's also a chance they just run out Vaughn and Elko and they call it a day and they and they let Vaughn keep playing and they have Elko as kind of the secondary DH first base guy. That that is possible and it's okay. Um, but I do think somebody like a Hoskins or a Bell would still be at least something to potentially get some value from. And, and whether it be and offensively, you get a power guy in your lineup and you could potentially flip either of those guys. Both of them are only 32 years old. So at least they have some value in terms of deadline acquisition potentially. All right. So we've been talking to the just baseball Elijah Evans, but let, let's also bring in the, the future Sox Elijah Evans here for this next part, because I think they've got enough arms. Crochet is probably coming. I saw the estimate. It's like two and a half million dollars. I mean, yes, maybe they trade him. Maybe they do that. Maybe they trade him. Maybe him talking about getting an extension. Maybe that's a real thing. I, let, let's wait and see what happens. But just assuming that he's sitting in there, you, you got Drew Thorpe coming back. I want to see him pitching every five days. I want to see Jonathan Cannon pitching every five days. I want to see Sean Burke for sure pitching every five days. I mean, and then you've got you've got a lot of other names that could be that that fifth guy between whether or not it's Davis Martin or Iriarte. And you have you have a you have a group of young guys and you'd like to see them pitch. You think Noah Schultz is probably getting here at some point next year. You would think Hagen Smith could probably get here at some point next year. There's a lot of pitching coming. Am I wrong about them having that much depth? Because you're saying we should still go out and get a starting pitcher. Okay, so so here's my reasoning on this one. I, I'm working under the assumption crochet is traded so that is basically to, to preface kind of why i still said you know pitching right i, I wrote I have this whole article coming out for jb this week that I'll, I'll that really dives into each kind of option rotationally but i think you're completely right but let me start with that right like there is a lot of pitchers coming on the way you know even guys like mistrini like bush like iriarte they struggled in their first mlb go but they all need innings at the big league level sooner than later mason adams is on the way Schultz and Hagen are going to be a little while longer, but I still think end of 2025, you're looking at a potential call-up, right? So there is a lot of pitchers. I agree with you completely on Cannon, Thorpe, and Burke. Those are the first three guys I mentioned in my article. Those three need to be in the rotation. They deserve to be in the rotation. Let's get them in the rotation, right? I'm working under the assumption Crochet is traded, and ultimately that leaves a rotation with nothing but first and second year players, and they're not going to want to do that. Uh, the, no organization is whether or not these they trust these guys or not, I don't see a world where the White Sox go into the season with all first, second-year players in the rotation, in which case, if they're trading Crochet, they're going to fill that spot with some sort of veteran. And that's why I, I put a few veterans in that in that tweet I made of just like, you know, a, again, nobody flashy, right? But if you sign a veteran that has starting experience but also could be a guy you can bump to the bullpen if you need to and or trade at the deadline, that makes the most sense for me to sign one pitcher, just one, definitely not more than one, 
But if you're trading crochet, signing one veteran pitcher to fill out a very young rotation, but also with the flexibility to bump them to the bullpen or to trade them if these young pitchers do as well as we hope they're going to do, because I completely agree. The priority is these young pitchers, 100 percent. I just think you have to fill a rotation with one vet if you're going to be trading crochet. Yeah, you were looking at guys like Nick Pavetta, Andrew Heaney, John Means, and, and that that's an that's a tier that makes an awful lot of sense for the team. Before I let you go, Edgar Caro, is he going to be ready to go this year? Because that's the only like I'm more hopeful for him showing up and making an impact right now than Jordan Montgomery, who stumbled. Yeah. Um, so I I wrote in the article that I, that's coming out this week, and that the reason I didn't even mention him in that tweet you're talking about of my free agency, the catching duo in Chicago is going to be Corey and Edgar Carroll this year. I'm pretty dang confident. Um, I think he breaks camp, honestly. I really do. I think he breaks camp at 21 years old, and he's going to be more of a platoon with Corey Lee because as much as Corey Lee was not consistent with his bat, he still is someone who provides strong defense. Pitchers seem to like working with him. And, and the, the thing with Carroll, right, is like, not only is Caro took and t- he took a huge step forward this past season, right? He was the best hitter. He, he was the best overall offensive player in the minor league system all season. Like from a, from just an impact perspective, from a from a plate approach, from tapping into his power more, his defense has been improving. He's also worked with all of these pitchers, man. It's like you, there there is something to that that I don't think enough you know general fans watching take into consideration, right? Like this is a guy who has grown for two years now with every single one of these pitchers you just mentioned, right? Edgar Caro spent time in Birmingham and in Charlotte with Sean Burke, with Jonathan Cannon, with Drew Thorpe, with Nick Mastrini, with Jairo Uriarte, with you know Noah Schultz this past year even, right? Like he's worked with all of these guys. And all these guys like him. Like, I can tell you directly, like, from talking to a lot of these pitchers, like, they love working with Caro. He calls a really sophisticated game. He works really well with his pitchers. He's great in communication. This guy is the best catching potential catcher the White Sox have had, probably since A.J. Brzezinski. I, I really don't think that's that far-fetched to say. Uh, he's super young, so they're going to probably rely on Corey Lee a little bit more early in the season. But I think you're looking at a platoon between the two of them. And, and worst case, you start if you, if you Carroll really has a rough spring, right, you start the season with whoever, Chucky Robinson. I don't care who it is. Sooner than later, even if it's not immediately opening day, I think it should be opening day. If somehow it's not opening day, by May at the very latest, it's a, it's a platoon between Carroll and Lee with the hope that by second half of the season, it's 70 30 in Caro's favor. Hey, that's the one thing that I'm uh, excited about. I'm excited to see him get up here. Um, I feel like the, I think the thing that we're going to struggle with the most, Elijah, is where do you find those middle infielders? Like you, you get, you need Colson that you need Colson to figure it out. You got to figure out Lenin Sosa is not very good defensively. Like we've suggested it, like maybe he's a first baseman of the future. Like they've got to figure that out. This is my, this is my thing. Like, and I didn't mention somebody in the comments did a really good job mentioning some middle infield guys. Cause I wouldn't be surprised if they sign a middle infielder, but what I don't want to happen is another Nicky Lopez-esque signing, right? Where it's like, you're getting a guy to fill a spot, but it doesn't really matter, right? Like, that's what I don't want to see. I, I, what I really want to see is giving those guys some run. I think with, the, with, you know, with, with other positions like right field, like there's nobody you need to give run to prevent you from signing a free agent. I'd rather just see a middle infield with, with Brooks Baldwin and with Brian Ramos on that third base and Colson Montgomery at shortstop, whatever it is. I kind of just want to see it at this point because I know it wasn't great last year, right? And none of those guys, you know, Brooks and Ramos both really struggled at the big league level. Colson had a rough year in AAA. Colson did finish the season strong. He looks really good in the Arizona Fall League right now. Um, I know that's, you know, take it with a grain of salt, of course. He's playing against some, you know, 20-year-olds and such, right? But, like, he is going to be up next year sooner than later. Maybe not breaking camp, but he will be with the team soon. So I'm fine signing one veteran middle infielder to kind of fill innings for the time being. But I do want the priority to still be Brooks, Colson, and Ramos in that infield because at some point you've just got to let it see what happens and give them enough innings, right? Like Ramos and, and Brooks all both only had about 100 bats in the big leagues. 100 bats is not enough. I mean, Sosa has had a lot of it passed over the past few years in the big leagues, right? That's a little bit of a different story. So if you don't think Colson is ready yet, I'm fine signing a veteran, you know, Ahmed Rosario type, somebody along those lines. I'm sure, a Whit Merrifield, we've heard that every last offseason for like four years, right? But like, I'm fine with that for now but I still think the priority in the infield should be those three prospects who I do believe are all going to be big league level players with some time. All right, Elijah Evans, Just Baseball, Future Sox. Good friend of the show. Appreciate you jumping on. Always, Chris. Always happy to talk. I appreciate you having me. Sox in the Basement listeners trying to make the most of your money. Give a call to Tom Walsh, your Edward Jones financial advisor. Located on the corner of 111th and Kedzie, but serving the Chicagoland area, 
Tom has a get-to-know-you approach and a do-the-right-thing attitude. He's been doing this for decades. It's all about knowing your options when you're investing and planning for your retirement. No matter what stage you are at, it costs nothing to check in with Tom. Give Tom Walsh or Edward Jones Financial Advisor a call today, 773-779-0023. Edward Jones, member SIPC. First base continues to be something that I sit there and say, I don't know why you keep Andrew Vaughn when you either want to give Vargas and Ramos both at bats and you could move Vargas over to first base where you could consider moving Sosa over to first base because his defense isn't that good, but he was hitting really well. And you can look at the fact that his entire career, the entire career B-War, baseball reference wins above replacement for Andrew Vaughn is 1.1. Over the last two seasons, these guys have already accumulated more wins. Christian Walker will be available in free agency. Pete Alonzo will be available in free agency. Walker's got 6.8 war. Alonzo, 5. Santana, Carlos Santana, 4.5. Paul Goldschmidt, 4.4. Ryan O'Hearn, 3.2. Justin Turner, if he decides to play at 40 and and isn't going to be playing third base, could stand over at first base and give you 2.2. Wilmer Flores is still above. Andrew Vaughn at 33 years old. And then you got guys like Reese Hoskins. And again, Reese Hoskins didn't have a good year last year, but he's a guy that over his career has an 11 B war. So he's, he's still an upside guy that you go, there's so many options. That's why I don't see why you would keep Vaughn or sheets because there's so many guys that are sitting out there. And why wouldn't you inject a little bit of veteran leadership ability and so, and a better bat into your lineup that if halfway through the year, Ed, that guy's hitting. Now you can go pick up a prospect for him if you're out of it, which you probably are going to be. You're showing these young guys how to go about their business because you brought in some professional hitters. So, I mean, I th- really think that that's that they've got to go look at first base and at the, at the just the deluge of guys that are sitting there that can contribute with a bat. And who cares if they're in their 30s? There's they're somebody who's going to be of value halfway through the year and is going to give you something better than Sheets and Vaughn. They have to look in that direction. They, I mean, there are other guys that are sitting there in the middle infield, but I would think your higher end middle infield guys, like I would love to have Hassan Kim, but there's a, it's a mutual option. Maybe he gets out of it, but he's gotten almost a seven war over the last two years. And he is 29 years old. And I would love to have him in my middle infield mix. And you could probably afford him. And maybe if I were the general manager, I go get him. I just don't know if Getz has, has it in him to go make a move like that. Cause you'd have to sign him to a multi-year deal. Well, and I think that's what, when Chris Gatt says he's not going to be deep in free agency too, I think the other thing to prepare yourself for is there's maybe only going to be one, maybe, maybe two multi-year deals handed out. And those are probably going to be for pitchers, I would guess, rather than position players. I think you're more likely to see somebody like Reese Hoskins get a one-year prove-it deal and and have him try and reclaim where he was on the pecking order of, of Major League First Baseman and turn him into a guy that is either going to be you know, a nice veteran presence in the clubhouse and a, and a middle of the order sta- stabilizing bat, right? Or he's going to be that trade fodder that you just mentioned where some team in contention is going to know Reese Hoskins has done it before and is going to know Reese Hoskins can do it again and is going to see that he's over his injury issues and that he's back to his old self and he's hitting and he's going to be valuable as a first baseman, DH, bench bat, starter, whatever they need him to be. I, I don't know that with like a Ha Song Kim, that the White Sox are going to look at him and go, okay, he's worth a five-year commitment the way a team that's in a win-now mode or has you know absolutely nothing going on in the middle infield will look at that because Colson Montgomery had a lousy year, and he's not going to be ready for the start of the year, I don't think. Uh, he would have to come into camp, first of all, in the quote-unquote best shape of his life, which they're all going to do, and that's, of course, a relative term. But the other thing is, is that he's going to have to prove it, not only in spring training, he might actually have to prove it in Charlotte again a little bit before he makes it to the team. But at some point, you know, you're not looking to block out somebody that you think might be better in the long term. And that's why Nicky Lopez sticking around, I think, is probably something that will happen because Chris Getz wants to commit to the defensive thing. I would understand Lopez coming back more than Vaughn and Sheets because It is very thin at the middle infield in free agency unless you're going to go get a guy that you have to spend a lot of money on and give several years to. 
Right. You don't want to overpay at this middle and with, with what's out there. Right. Cause you're, you're not getting, you're not getting a cornerstone uh, on this free agent market. That said, Andrew Vaughn and Gavin Sheets being penciled in as starters, I don't want to see it. I, I'm done with it. It just it doesn't make any sense to me. You could do better. You got to make a move somewhere. You got You got to do something at some point that changes the makeup of your team. I we had James Fox on a few weeks ago, and he suggested the idea of Tim Elko being the first baseman. What I'm saying is, you've got plenty of money that you can spend to go get a guy like Hoskins or somebody else that I mentioned already that's going to give you far more value and sit in the middle of your lineup. And that guy can go play first base, right? And he can go stand out there and he can hit the ball for the first half of the year and he gets on fire and you end up moving on from him and you pick up a great piece that's going to be usable right away in the next year or so because that's what they've been targeting up to this point. They're not looking for a lot of single A ball players. They're trying to make, they're trying to flip this. They're trying to find those major league ready bats. You go and you do that and you move that guy to a contender. You have Elko still that can come up here in the second half of the season. You still have the option, again, of Vargas standing at first base or or if you want to figure it out that way or Sosa moving over. Like, I I would be okay with them, Ed, letting go of Sheets and Vaughn, replacing those players with just one bat if it was a good bat. And if you're trying to convince me, like, okay, we just want to bring in one really good bat here that we can move on from because we do want to still see what Vargas can do or we want to move Sosa over. And then you come up with another plan for what's going to be standing at second base. That would make sense, too. It's easy to say you got to bring in two bats and first base is where you want to look at. But imagine if they brought in one hitter that was a first baseman, one one hitter similar to Haskins. Let's look at the list of the guys. Some of them uh, Elijah went over in right field. Right field would be an easy place to add to. There's a lot of outfield that's going to be out there and a lot of guys that are going to bring better value to you. Add those two bats onto your team. Maybe another middle infielder that you like in there. And if you want to move Sosa into a DH or first base role, and now suddenly you can get a little stronger up the middle. You can add a few more bats there. You can move some guys in the middle part of the season. You can pick up some prospects. You're going to be a better team. And you give a little support to these young pitchers because I don't know how you're going to get these young pitchers to develop properly if they're out there constantly trying to be perfect because you can't score any runs. Well, you're not going to. It's like, you know, think about it this way. If you've ever had an injury before, like I injured my back one time and it took forever for it to get better. Why? Because other muscles start compensating because you start walking a little different because now you start to like you're, you're avoiding pain. So you're doing things differently and now you cause other injuries, not having Viable bats in the middle of your order and the ability to score runs is going to hamper the development of your pitchers because they're going to feel like they got to be perfect because you can't just take competitiveness out of it. You can't look at them like, kid, it doesn't matter. We lose 110. They don't want to lose 110. They're going to want to win. No, they can't afford to do that anymore. And they're going to make mistakes trying to thread the needle with a team that can't score runs. You want this team to develop. Don't put all the pressure on the young developing guys. Bring in a few guys that can hit the ball and alleviate some of the pressure. You got the money to do it. And you can still stay at the lowest in Major League Baseball. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.